Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us today on a very special day here in America. That's right, it is Thanksgiving. So hopefully you are having a fun and safe celebration wherever you are. And appropriately, today's program is all about some seaworthy celebrations. We are going to talk a little bit about how sailors built their own community at sea and some of the amazing things that they celebrated while they were out in the ocean for six to nine months at a time, including... Thanksgiving, of course. My name's Alicia, and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum here in New York City. I'll be your host today. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering programs just like these, I invite you to check out the links in the description. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So our complex is located on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River, and our museum is housed inside of a historic World War II era aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. Now on site, we have a historic Cold War era submarine, the Space Shuttle Enterprise, a British Airways Concorde, and all sorts of other really amazing aircraft. But as you can kind of imagine, and as you can really see in this picture here, it is really big. Our ship is 913 feet long. Now that is so big that if you took it and you stood it up on its end, it would be as tall as a New York City skyscraper. And it's actually so long that you could just about play three games of football on top at the exact same time. Now, it was constructed way back in 1943 for a very specific purpose. It was made during a time when we were fighting countries all the way across oceans. And, you know, we didn't want to have to launch our planes over here in America and then fly them all the way across the water to get over there because that would just take way too much fuel. It would take way too much time. And honestly, our aircraft just couldn't do it yet. So we created these things called aircraft carriers, just like the Intrepid, to effectively act like a floating airport for us. Now, something else that I do like to point out is a little bit about the history of how this ship was made. So the keel of the ship, the bottom part, was actually laid in Newport News, Virginia on December 1st, 1941, in preparation for World War II. And then just six days later, on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked, a day that will live in infamy. And that dragged the United States into conflict, and it also dragged a number of their male shipyard workers into war overseas, too. So about 400 women were then called to temporarily fill in some of their positions in those shipyards to keep up with wartime needs, a couple of which actually you can see here in this photograph here a really interesting newspaper clipping we've got about its launch. And really their presence was felt immediately. This giant Essex-class aircraft carrier was estimated to take three years to construct. But thanks to their hard work, it ended up taking just 17 months. Now the headline of this clipping here is from the New York Times. This is 1943 and it says, women at work, they, they help turn out the ships of war. And, you know, in many ways, maybe we could say then that the celebration for the Intrepid, the first celebration really, uh, was kind of like the baby shower or the baptism, you could say. It was really the ceremonial ship launching. And that was a really important ceremony to them. So on April 26th, 1943, just prior to its launch, the USS Intrepid underwent this longtime naval tradition to wish it good luck, which of course included Helen Smith Hoover, who you can see here, the wife of a Navy admiral. And there she is on the bottom, smashing a bottle of champagne against the ship and officially naming it as it is launched out to sea. Now, the other photo shows a ceremonial gift exchange between her and one of the welders from the shipbuilding yards as well. So our ship was in service from 1943 to 1974, and it later became a museum in 1982 after, believe it or not, being saved from the scrapyard. So, of course, being a museum, we do like to display lots of cool things to bring the space to life, such as these. Hey, <laughs> now I know you might be looking at this here and wondering, what chairs? Why, why do you have chairs on display? This doesn't look very exciting. Well, everyone, these are artifacts, and they can help to tell us a lot about what life was like on board the ship. Now, if you look at this, some of them 
might look a little common, you know, maybe similar to chairs that you might even have at your, uh, your home or at work or school. And then some of them might look a little more complicated as well. But this is actually a wonderful way for us to take a closer look at what people were doing on board a ship like the Intrepid. So when we look at them, we can think about things like how they were used just based on how they look. Uh, maybe if you've seen them somewhere before, you can associate it with that. And you can think about maybe where they might have been on the ship itself, too. So everyone, take a second here. I want you to take a look here and make a mental note to yourself or maybe point on the screen here. Which of these chairs do you think looks the most boring? All right. Which of these is the most kind of normal Boring, everyday average chair. Maybe you've even sat on a chair like this at an office or at school. What do you think? To me, when I look at these chairs, everyone, I think this one right here, this green one on the end, it kind of looks the most boring and typical to me. This is a pretty standard looking office chair. And it tells us that just like on land, people held regular office jobs while on board the Intrepid at sea as well. Not everyone was a pilot, you know, not everyone had to lift and lower the anchor. There was plenty of important paperwork that had to be done as well. So that is actually just one type of job that we might find on board. Now, I want you to take a look again and tell me now, which do you think here, or make a mental note, which do you think on the screen is the most comfortable chair? All right. Take all those chairs in there. Which of these do you think would be the most comfortable to sit on? Maybe something you could imagine curling up into, maybe after you eat Thanksgiving dinner, you know, curl for some, some TV. It's soft and cozy. What do you think? When I look at this, everyone, I think that this one, these brown one here, these two brown ones next to each other in the middle, I think they look the most comfortable. They look, you know, very cushiony. Uh, in fact, I think it kind of looks like a nice, you know, comfy recliner chair, maybe one that you might even have in your own living room, or uh, maybe one of those really comfy movie theater seats. But believe it or not, these were used specifically for pilots in their ready room. So pilots had one of the most stressful jobs on board Intrepid. So the ready room was designed to be as comfortable for them as possible. And here's a picture of a bunch of pilots in those seats. And, you know, you can kind of think of the ready room like a classroom where they'd all learn about their missions. Uh, and actually underneath the seats, they had little lockers for their things, uh, even some desks that could fold up and over over their laps there to take some notes. And they would sit on these chairs in order to prepare for their flights. So it was kind of like a school chair, but you know, kind of a really comfy one. And I don't know about you, but I might fall asleep if I were sitting in a class in one of those chairs. Now, after the pilots were in this chair, they actually got into another chair. And that's this one right here. Now, a lot of times people say this one looks like the scariest chair or the most exciting looking chair here. So does anyone happen to know what a chair like this is called? Maybe tell me in the chat if you happen to know. Very uh, interesting thing to look at here. It's this light greenish one. Uh, it's got all these straps on it. Very complicated, kind of scary, not going to lie. But I bet all those straps and some of that padding on it might have something to do with the purpose of that chair. Anyone happen to know what it's called? This chair, everyone, is called an ejection chair. So see, a long time ago, if something bad happened to your plane, you actually had to climb out of your cockpit and you had to climb out onto the wing of your plane and then jump off from there. And then hopefully, of course, you had your parachute with you and then you could you know, kind of float back down to safety, um, down into the water. But as you can imagine, that was super dangerous. And actually, here is an image of one of those ejection chairs being used. Look at the force at which that pilot is being shot up through that cockpit there. So if you imagine everyone that the plane is going forward, all right, then the tail of it, the back end of it, might get tangled up in your parachute after you jump out. So these ejection seats were created. You'd actually pull a handle either on the top or on the bottom, and it would shoot you up and away from your plane. Then your plane would go down and then you could float right back down to safety with your parachute into the water below. Now, everyone, if you landed in the ocean, sometimes, you know, maybe you were a little far away from your ship. You didn't necessarily land right next to your own ship. And maybe another ship had to come and pick you up.
But remember, all your stuff is still maybe back on the Intrepid, right? So eventually, you had to transfer ships. And that is where this chair on the end comes in. All right. So this chair on the end, it's white. It's got this kind of metal frame around it. Kind of looks like almost like a birdcage, right? So this actually worked kind of like a zip line. So there's a cable that would go through the very top of the chair. You can see there's a little loop up at the top there. And that would actually connect it from one ship to another ship. And then it would just zip you across the water to get them, uh, get whoever was in that chair, back to their ship. And here is actually a great picture of that chair in action. So you can see it really there, bringing it to life for you a bit more. It's right there in the center between those two ships uh, with someone sitting on it for a food resupply. So it kind of looks like a wild ride, huh? Uh, but definitely very important for those ships to maintain a similar speed so that they could do that and uh, get that pilot safely crossed. Now, there is one last chair, everyone, that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is this one right here. Take a close look. Can anyone tell me what kind of a chair this one looks like? Tell me in the chat if you happen to know, if you have any idea. What does this kind of look like to you? And of course, keeping in mind that it is kind of old, but still definitely functions the same way pretty much now. What's that look like to you? Any guesses? This one, everyone, actually, well, maybe some might say this is actually the scariest chair. This is a dentist chair. So why do we have a dentist chair on display at the Intrepid Museum, right? Well, once again, this is here to remind us that while the Intrepid was traveling around the world, these men would be out at sea for a very long time about six to nine months at a time. And because they were out in the middle of the ocean, they had to take everything with them that they might want to have at home. And that also included people like dentists and doctors and surgeons in case they got sick or they had an emergency. They also had people like barbers there so they could get their hair cut. That was very important in order to stay in uniform. So all of these community worker positions that we might take for granted, you know, having them in our neighborhoods, maybe right down the street even, they also had to think about taking with them and having them on board too. So again, it's this idea of having a whole city at sea on board the ship with them. That was really, really very important. All right, everyone. So I want to pause here and see if we have any questions about the Intrepid or any life on board the Intrepid as well. So how many people served on the Intrepid? Absolutely. The Intrepid typically had about 3,200 men on board at any time. And they were, again, all out at sea for six to nine months at a time. Now, if you think about it, that's actually just about the length of an entire school year, right? And also keep in mind that a lot of these guys were, you know, 18 to 23 years old. So they were all pretty young, really. And for many of them, this was the first time that they were away from home, too. So it was kind of exciting, of course, but I would imagine also pretty scary for them, too. So as we'll talk about a little bit later uh, to on today, celebrations were really a great way for them to bond and many times, you know, really make them feel a little bit more at home with things like food and other traditions that they had. Great question. Any others? Uh, did any women serve on the Intrepid? No. So throughout its 31 years in service, no women ever served on board. That's actually just how things were back then. But I always like to say, you know, it is impossible to pass through the ship's decks without encountering the impact of women in some way. Uh, many women, again, like I said, helped to build the Intrepid, first of all, because so many men, uh, you know, had to go fighting overseas, of course. So the ship is floating today because of them. Uh, and of course, you know, you've probably heard of Rosie the Riveter, these ladies that uh, took on factory jobs to help to build planes and engines during the war. Well, many of those planes uh, and their engines flew off of the Intrepid. And women actually became test pilots for the first time during World War II as well. Uh, Grumman Aircraft out on Long Island actually had the first female test pilots. Uh, and they flew bombers and fighter planes to get them all ready for battle. So, yeah, while no women directly served on board, they definitely did help out behind the scenes. So super question, everyone. Now, this idea of community, right, was really important to the sailors because, again, you imagine if you're out at sea for nine months, you're going to be away from your friends and your family, and you're probably going to miss a lot of holidays that you would normally spend with them as well. Now, within communities, often you can find others who celebrate things 
like holidays that you or your family might celebrate. Maybe, you know, it's holidays like Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa in December, uh, or of course, Thanksgiving, like we do here in America and we are doing today. So they thought it was important to try to recreate that sense of being at home and to really capture holiday spirits with things like decorations and traditional foods and really trying to bring to life that joy that we associate with different holidays each year. And while, of course, they may not be the families that they were born into at the time, they celebrated and they created new bonds with new families, um, with those that they served on board with on their ships. So I'm curious, everyone, actually, um, for those of you tuning in right now, I'd love to hear what are some events that you celebrate at home? Maybe it's your favorite holiday. Uh, maybe it's a big traditional meal that your family eats for something. Or maybe you celebrate a milestone like a birthday or an anniversary or also an achievement like maybe a graduation or a new job. And how do you celebrate it? Let me know in the chat. I'd love to hear all these different, you know, unique family traditions and personal traditions that people have. And while you're doing that, let's talk about some of these celebrations and what they look like on board Intrepid. Now, one of the first things that often comes to people's minds when they think of celebrations is, of course, food. And Thanksgiving is certainly no exception. In general, you know, I know I do love a big feast or getting to go out to dinner at some fancy restaurant in order to celebrate something always a reason to celebrate something, right? Well, year round, something that the Navy has always been known for is really good food. Because of course, if you are going to send thousands of young men out to sea for six to nine months at a time, what better way than to bribe them with some good food, right? <laughs> the food really helped to keep their morale up at all times, but especially during the holidays. And Intrepid in particular was known for having some really, really great food. So Intrepid's cooks prepared about seven tons of food every day to feed the hungry crew of over 3,000 men. On board, there were two large kitchens called galleys, fully equipped with the same grills and fryers and ovens that you might find in a large restaurant. But you can imagine what a really hot and fast paced and exhausting job it would have been to feed all of those ravenous young men on any normal day, let alone during the holidays. But typically at mealtimes, crewmen lined up on the chow line, just like the men you can see here on the left in 1967. So sailors took steel trays right through a serving line. They selected the food they wanted. Uh, it was dished out for about 15 hours a day, uh, starting way before breakfast and going even until after dinner. And the men then took their food and returned to the mess area or the dining area nearby to eat. And you can imagine it kind of like a big cafeteria that you might have at school. It was this common area with long tables that everyone could sit at and share meals. So the bakers on board, though, also made all the bread and pastries from scratch. In the bake shop, groups of about three or four sailors would work 12-hour shifts to get all of that done. And the night shift would bake as many as 800 loaves of bread. Can you imagine all of that bread? The day shift then would prepare things like desserts, uh, typically always something sweet, as many as uh, 60 smaller cakes and pies and cobblers and cookies uh, for every single lunch or dinner. And of course, specialties for the holidays too. Uh, they also had things like muffins and cinnamon rolls or other pastries, you know, just always on the chow line um, at breakfast time as well. But imagine again, how hot it would be with all of those oven 800 loaves of bread constantly going at the same time. I, you know, I salute those men. Amazing. Uh, and you can see some of them on the right there with all of those loaves. Incredible. Now, chow was a chance to relax and really take a break from work. And food, again, was especially important for morale around the holidays for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And this would include, of course, traditional holiday favorites like turkey and ham and many desserts to help to pass the long hours at sea and to really bond the crew into a tight knit team. So here in America, though, Thanksgiving Day is, of course, a national holiday. And it is, of course, uh, something that began as a giving a day of giving thanks for the harvest. So let me know in the chat. Are you celebrating Thanksgiving today? And what do you plan to eat for Thanksgiving? Hmm. Let's take a look at what they ate on the Intrepid, shall we? 
So here's a menu uh, from Thanksgiving dinner that was served on board the Intrepid. So they often printed these beautiful commemorative menus that the sailors could keep to remember the day as a souvenir with a festive image on it and the meal that they were served. So this particular one that we're looking at here is actually uh, from 1945. And if you take a look at this menu here, huh, does your family eat any of these same foods for the holidays? Does it look familiar to you? So on here, they've got things like roast turkey and gravy, mashed sweet potatoes, cream of tomato soup, oyster dressing. You know, a lot of foods that typical American households might be eating tonight on Thanksgiving Day. So for certain celebrations, we often associate certain foods or celebrate it in a particular way as a form of tradition or a custom handed down from one generation to another. And of course, turkey on Thanksgiving is certainly one of those for us here in America and certainly for those men aboard the Intrepid II, which was an American aircraft carrier. Now, another thing that people often associate with holidays are, of course, decorations. So when the ship was first built in the 1940s, it was, of course, during World War II, it was a very difficult time. So Christmas was very important to the sailors. But there was actually a lot of rationing going on at the time. And that means that products that, you know, were around that they would buy, they didn't use as much metal or nylon, for instance, because they wanted to save all of that to be able to use it in the military to make things like planes or bullets or parachutes and things like that. So people both at home and at sea had to kind of get a little creative with their decorations or even their clothing. If you've ever heard of women, you know, drawing eyeliner up the back of their legs instead of wearing nylons. But they had to get a little creative uh, with what they had. And they would often make or ha really hand make decorations uh, or even whole trees like this picture on the left made out of strips of fabric and wire. So sailors often had to just make do with whatever they could find around the ship uh, in, or, or their base or wherever they happened to be in order to decorate, which often led, of course, to them getting pretty creative. So if you check out this bulletin board from the Intrepid in 1967, it says, ho, 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 Merry Christmas to all and a Happy New Year. And that is decorated with some paper plates and Christmas cards that were put up in the shape of Santa Claus and a head drawn on top there, though I think he's wearing a gas mask, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, and on the bottom, there is a lovely spread of nuts and fruits for the crew with some festive decorations. But that tree to me looks like it is made out of a bunch of coffee filters. Very creative, huh? Now, in addition to holidays, they also celebrated traditional milestones. For centuries, sailors have engaged in these rituals when the ships crossed certain markers, such as the equator. And again, these were really meant to bond the sailors and to boost their morale. So, for instance, on January 22nd, 1944, the first crew to serve on the aircraft carrier Intrepid crossed the equator. So the crew marked the occasion with this time-honored naval tradition called the line crossing ceremony. Now, the open seas have, of course, been the subject of myths and legends since the beginning of seafaring. And early sailors would actually pray to the god Neptune, the god of the sea, to ask for protection from things like monsters and storms. And at some point, more than 400 years ago, the line crossing ceremony began for sailors, and it celebrates their transformation from something called a slimy polywog, so that's someone who's never crossed the line of the equator, to a trusty shellback, who is also called a son or daughter of Neptune. And that's someone who has become part of this fraternity of seasoned sailors. So it was a way for sailors to be tested for their seaworthiness, but also just have a lot of fun with their friends. So here's how this very highly theatrical event would work, as illustrated here on the right by a number of pictures throughout history. And yes, actually, this does still happen today. The day before a ship would cross the equator, King Neptune, played by typically the most veteran sailor on board, even the captain at times, come across, comes across to proclaim his authority and to pass judgment on these polywogs who he claims haven't properly honored him yet. Now, he also arrives with his court, typically comprised of his queen, who's often played by a sailor in drag. Then you also have Davy Jones, the royal baby, and all these other dignitaries. And they're all elaborately dressed in costumes, as you can see in these very fun pictures here. 
Now, the Pollywogs, the newbies, entertain them with a talent show. And then the next morning, after being forced to eat a very unappetizing breakfast, usually it's incredibly spicy, they perform a variety of kind of embarrassing and kind of messy activities uh, before finally taking a royal bath in a pool of garbage and receiving their official certificates. So these certificates here, as you can see, declare them to be shellbacks and they acknowledge their initiation into what is referred to as the solemn mysteries of the ancient order of the deep. So this certificate was awarded to Louis Gross, who served aboard Intrepid on its very first equator crossing in 1944. But it wasn't just the equator crossings that they celebrated. The crew, the, the crew also commemorated circumnavigation, uh, which means basically going around the globe during the Vietnam War. And uh, the Order of Magellan certificate that you can see on the bottom there uh, is one of those things that helps to acknowledge that. Also, other certificates initiate sailors into the Order of the Golden Dragon for crossing the international dateline towards Asia, and the Royal Order of the Blue Noses for crossing the Arctic Circle, and uh, the Royal Domain of the Emperor Penguin for crossing the Antarctic Circle. Now, some other fun ones that if you were uh, part of the Goldfish Club for pilots who ditched their planes into the ocean, um, they had to maybe take to a life raft. All right. So uh, that, of course, is the goldfish. You're swimming in the ocean. Uh, you also had um, the Caterpillar Club for anyone who had to maybe bail out using a parachute. So, of course, the silky material of the parachute being kind of like a silkworm or a caterpillar. Uh, a member of the commissioning crew of a ship was something called a plank owner. And they also actually later got an actual plank of the ship when it was later decommissioned. And uh, in order to qualify for the Royal Order of Whale Bangers, you had to have been on board a ship when it was mistakenly firing at a whale, thinking that it was a submarine. <laughs> I love that one. So, you know, a lot of really fun things to help to keep them entertained while they were there. Now, of course, these certificates weren't official Navy awards, but they did mean a lot to sailors and to the community on board the ship. And they also just really made for some really great memories and really documented where a sailor has been and what they have done. So everyone, I want to pause here one more time and see if we've got any other questions uh, before we move on. So let's see here. Did they have religious services? They did. So all year round, actually, um, but especially during the holidays, of course, in order to help to keep people's individual customs and traditions alive. Uh, ships recognized, of course, that crewmen had a variety of faiths. So services were held that honored many of those traditions at the time. Uh, the crew members would typically gather in Intrepid's hangar deck. That's kind of what we refer to as like the garage for planes, kind of under the flight deck there, uh, to celebrate mass on Christmas Eve. And a number of prayers were also printed on menus for a variety of faiths too. Um, and we've actually got in our archives a Jewish calendar from 1944 that was given out uh, that had Jewish prayers in English and in Hebrew. And um, veteran services were also available to them nearby uh, some of their posts and bases on land to help to find things like synagogues uh, as well. Uh, so that's, just, yeah, just a few ways that the crew could practice their personal beliefs while they were away from home. Absolutely. Any other questions? How did they get a Christmas tree on the ship? Yeah, so that picture that you saw earlier of them decorating what kind of looked like a tree. It wasn't actually a pine tree like you might have at Christmas, uh, but they made one to look like it. So during World War II and the Vietnam War, uh, they were often, you know, in tropical climates, right? So you don't have pine trees out there in tropical climates. Uh, so, you know, even if they were on land, um, they wouldn't even necessarily have access to trees or pine trees. So instead they might decorate palm trees if they happen to be in warmer climates. Or if they were out in the middle of the ocean, they would even just make their own makeshift trees out of pipes and hoses and, you know, hang all sorts of things off of it, like bullet casings or, or paint can lids and gas pumps and things. Uh, so again, it was really just about trying to bring a bit of that experience that they might have at home on board the ship with them or on base, wherever they were, uh, even if it wasn't exactly the same. And again, they did have to get pretty creative. <laughs> All right, my friends. So, you know, I know now there are, of course, a ton of other celebrations that we have, um, you know, at home, on land here. And there were, of course, a ton of other events that they would have on board naval ships. And most of them 
I think even on, you know, at home too, we could say a lot of the food, very important, but oftentimes when you're celebrating something, you also would tend to include a cake. And celebrations and their accompanying cakes really brought the entire crew together and really boosted morale and helped the crew to take their minds off of some of the more difficult aspects of naval service. So there's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of monotony. Uh, and then, of course, the sadder things like the danger and the death. Now, for instance, in August of 1944, the Intrepid crew members gathered to celebrate their very first anniversary. So the very first birthday, really, of Intrepid's commissioning. And this year, they had actually been through a lot. It was a very difficult year. The ship had entered the Pacific War. Um, it uh, was, you know, it had gotten in its first battle scars, really. It lost 30 members of its crew to combat or accidents. So again, they really needed a morale booster. So one really, really big year called for one really, really big birthday cake, as you can see here. So the Intrepid's, Intrepid's Bakers did not disappoint. They unveiled this elaborate creation for the first anniversary. It was a two-tiered sheet cake with a cake aircraft carrier perched on top. Now, the finished cake weighed over 728 pounds, and it required 90 dozen eggs to make. And here in this wonderful picture are the bakers putting some finishing touches on the frosting there. It says, congratulations, USS Intrepid, first anniversary. Look at that aircraft carrier made out of cake on top. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, likewise, in uh, 1968, the Intrepid was in the Vietnam War, and the crew took a break to gather on the flight deck to celebrate its 25th birthday, its 25th commissioning anniversary. And the ship's bakers designed an elaborate five layer sheet cake with airplanes on top and it weighed 1400 pounds. Now this is a full scale replica that we had on display with our cakes exhibit. And it was so big that the sailors had to move it on a bomb lift. And of course, you know, what took a week to make was polished off by those hungry sailors in the matter of just a couple of hours. But they found a lot of things to celebrate to keep their spirits high. Things like keeping a running count of arrested landings. So that's when an airplane's tail hook, when it's coming in for landing, it catches on a steel cable across the flight deck to bring it to a stop. Kind of imagine like Red Rover, but a lot harder. Uh, so on this photo, uh, this photo on the left here um, is it actually coming in for a landing. And in the photo on the right, you can see some pilots in the squadron uh, VF-162. They're celebrating their 51,000th, that's a big number, arrested landing on board the Intrepid in 1961. So the officers uh, called upon the ship's bakers, of course, to create cakes to celebrate arrested landing milestones just like that, uh, usually after every thousand safe landings. So 51,000 is actually a pretty big deal too. Now, in order to bake cakes, that big for so many people. Of course, you do need a lot of ingredients. I mentioned 90 dozen eggs before. That's a lot of eggs. So the Intrepid left port packed with enough supplies to sustain 3,000 crew members for long stretches at sea. And most of the provisions were canned or dried or frozen so that they could, as you would imagine, last as long as possible. And it's actually for that reason that a lot of recipes tend to include non-perishable items. So things like maybe oil as a binding agent instead of eggs, because eggs can go bad. So each Navy recipe was written to feed 100 people, just like this one you can see here. This is a very popular recipe for easy chocolate cake that you can see here. The cooks would scale the recipe then to feed the number of crew on their ship, uh, depending on how big it was. So the aircraft carrier Intrepid had a crew of 3,000 people, which means that the ship's bakers would have to multiply this recipe by 30 in order to feed the entire crew, because this one feeds a hundred portions. That's still a lot of cake, right? So this is a typical cake that they would make to feed them. But for the holidays, of course, they would make even more special recipes that called for much, much, much bigger cakes. Now, one of the amazing things that we do here at The Intrepid, everyone, is collect oral histories from veterans. And that means we talk to people about their experiences in the Navy or elsewhere. And I'm actually going to play a clip for you now from some men who got to experience some of these massive, amazing cakes firsthand or even made them themselves. So here we go, everyone. Take a watch.
Well, we're always very proud of special cakes that we made for the special occasions because if they do anything in the Navy is they eat cake. We celebrated Intrepid's 28th birthday. I remember that. We had a big birthday cake. The larger cakes that we made was averaging it for about 2,000, 3,000 people. It takes about roughly a week to make. And pound cake lasts is the best out of all the cakes. Average uh, eight pounds per sheet and each layer, each layer had 20 sheets. We had to put it on a bomb lift, bring the cake from the bakery up to the hangar. I mean, at one point they actually made a model of the Intrepid in, in cake. <laughs> so like I made that carrier cake. It's seven high and then we start trimming it, then adding to the top and things like that. It's a very big cake. I ate a very big piece. Uh, we used to average about uh, 50 to 60 cakes for dinner. There was 12 ovens. We had a, a, an 80 quart mixer. We had a fryer for donuts from the chief. He makes the schedule for what we had to make. We get the menu. We get the ingredients. These days here, now it's in the 60s, they kind of use their hands spreading it out. They never use a knife. It's faster, easier. Their hands are in the dough anyway. We made a peanut butter cake, made a white cake, chocolate cake, carrot cake. Everything that we did is for the guys because they're working hard all over the ship. It was a good experience for me. So imagine, right, needing, again, a bomb elevator to carry a cake that big. I mean, it sounds delicious. All of those different kinds he was talking about, the peanut butter cake, the carrot cake. Oh, I'm ready for some dessert. What about you? <laughs> but really ama amazing to hear, um, you know, firsthand from some of those people that were on board the ship and sounds delicious. Now, the last thing that I want to mention, everyone, is that, of course, the Intrepid wanted to make the crew feel at home. But sometimes they also had guests on board and they wanted to really pull out all of the stops. So if you've seen any of our other virtual programs, you might recall that we are, of course, a sea, air and space museum. All right, and uh, here you go. You can see uh, one of these specific exploits. All right, we are a space museum because the Intrepid picked up space capsules back during the space race during the Cold War. Well, astronauts, still today, I think, uh, were like celebrities back then, you know? And each time we picked up astronauts, it was a huge honor to have them on board our ship. So these photos are from the Gemini 3 mission in 1965. So, of course, once you've retrieved an astronaut or two, how can you make them feel a little bit special on board? Bake them a cake, obviously. So here you can see Gus Grissom and John Young after having splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean after their very successful Gemini 3 mission in 1965. And if you look closely at this picture, you also might notice what it is that they are cutting the cake with might surprise you. I don't know. A very big cake calls for, of course, a very large knife. So they are actually cutting their welcome back to earth cake with sabers. They are giant military swords that you can see on the right. That became a tradition as well, cutting cakes with giant swords. So if any of you happen to have swords and a cake tonight, I mean, hey, go at it, right? <laughs> Sounds fun. Now, Navy ships at sea, though, would also host special events, things like boxing matches and USO shows with concerts and actors and comedians who would come to really try to help to raise the spirits of those on board. Uh, if you've ever seen the show The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, you might have seen that she's actually doing stand-up comedy routine, um, you know, at a giant USO show for the Army in one of those episodes. So it's very similar to that. And on the right, you can see a picture of comedian Bob Hope and performer Anne Margaret from a Christmas USO tour that they did for the Armed Forces. They were very popular at the time. But as you can see in this picture, they're actually standing behind what looks like a giant stack of frosting making up a tree on another cake. So really, everyone... If you've learned nothing else today, you can leave here knowing that sailors liked to eat 
cake. <laughs> so my friends, that brings us to the end of another program for today. And I'm sure you all are so hungry now after all of this cake and food discussion ready to go for Thanksgiving meal tonight. But before we wrap up, I want to see if we do have any other questions. So any questions here? Uh, oh, what happens? What happened if a pilot missed the cable while landing? Sure. So um, that's referring, of course, to those arrested landings where the cable is stretched across the flight deck. They actually had five cables stretched across the flight deck there. Very, very strong. And on the back of a plane, there was a tail hook. And it kind of looked like of a candy cane, actually, on the back of a plane. Very strong, too. Uh, so as they were coming in, they would kind of, you know, drop that hook and they'd try to catch it on board or onto uh, one of the cables there. Uh, but if they were not able to snag onto it, it was something called a bolter. So they were always told as you're coming in, don't slow down, speed up, go full speed ahead. Because if you can't snag onto that cable, you have to just keep going, pull up, fly around again and try again. But I'll tell you, they were actually pretty good. Uh, and more often than not, they did not miss those cables. And if they did, their friends would definitely tease them for a while because that is a true sign of being an excellent uh, pilot on an aircraft carrier is being able to land your plane on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> All right, Anna, any other questions? Oh, why did they have swords on a Navy ship? To cut the cake, obviously. <laughs> no, the military sabers are actually part of their formal uniform. It's a holdover uh, from the olden days when they actually would need blades on, you know, old wooden battleships. We're talking, you know, 17, 1800s, right? They had these old, not giant steel aircraft carriers, these old wooden ships, and they had rigging. They had all of these, uh, you know, ropes coming down everywhere. Um, but now they're actually more ceremonial than anything else. It's a symbol of authority um, for the officers, and it's really meant more for decoration than anything else. Um, but there are a few really interesting uniform elements in the military like that. Um, for instance, I know in the Army, the helicopter pilots actually have spurs on their boots. And you would think, why on earth would you need spurs? on your boots to fly a helicopter. But again, it's a holdover from the days when the cavalry would be on horseback. So the spurs are for the horses. And of course, we don't really use horses in the military anymore. Instead, we use machinery like tanks and helicopters. So there you go. It's really more just kind of a formality and, and a holdover of, uh, you know, the olden days. So everyone, thank you so much for your questions today. If you happen to think of any other questions, you can always reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. I would like to thank you all so much for watching and sharing your questions, though, and your comments. Be sure to follow or subscribe to this channel and visit our website for our upcoming programs. Speaking of which, our next family program is going to be next week, Thursday at 3 p.m., and it will be Star Stories. So we are going to take a look at a number of constellations up in the night sky. We'll tell some stories about the cultures that uh, recognize different pictures in them around the world associated with them. And we'll also teach you some examples of how early navigators at sea use them to find their way. So once again, that's coming up next week on Thursday at 3 p.m. All right, my friends. So once again, thanks so much for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see you online for another virtual intrepid adventure. And of course, Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. See you next time.